Thank you. Very welcome. Beautiful. All right. We're rolling. Casey, what a beautiful thing to have people that want to celebrate your film that was made, what, 25 years ago. Yeah. Can you look mm -hmm. right here and talk to me about what it means to you for people that still want to celebrate this film 25 years later? I mean, it, it's, it's such an incredible gift because it really, it was a little independent film and, um, you know, I know directors uh, who can't access, the audience can't access, access films they made 25 years ago, you know what I mean? Uh, anything could have happened, but this is what happened. And so uh, it's a gift that I never could have predicted. and I never thought I would be uh, that lucky to have, for my first film, to have um, this kind of experience and for it to have this kind of longevity and to reach such a diverse audience over a long period of time. So, I mean, it's, it's an incredible gift. Uh, when I was honored with it uh, being included in the National Archives, that was as proud as I've ever been of anything, you know? It was um, any of my professional work. This inspires such pride in me and, um, you know, it's a very personal story, so that's meaningful as well. But, I mean, it, it's really an honor that um, is almost unimaginable and, and I'm grateful for it every day. <laughs> in 25 years? Um, uh, okay. well, while taking on the project. While taking on the project. Um, I guess I've learned not to be afraid of um, my demons. Uh, that this was a very good way of, of, of exploring aspects of myself and um, of my family and really trying to uh, communicate. I mean, one of the big things that I learned, though, as a lesson, um, my agent said to me one day when I was in post and kind of taking notes and aggravated, he said, it's not a painting, Casey. You know, and that was really meaningful, that this is a communication. Um, and even a painting is, you know, but, uh, but filmmaking really requires uh, an audience. It requires this level of communication with a lot of people, and it requires... Um, meaningful collaborators and and as as a matter of fact your film is only as good as your collaborators and so uh, that was you know that was a wonderful lesson to learn and of course I I sensed that and I gathered a really incredible group of people but um, just the community involved in filmmaking that was a huge uh, wonderful lesson for me you sort of answered this another way but mm -hmm. I, I just want to hear it from with this exact question, like 25 years later, if you could give any advice to your younger self oh, about yeah. bringing this project to life, bringing this story to yeah. life, what would it be? Um, it, it has to do with, with uh, drawing from your own self, you know, looking deep into your soul, um, trying to find the things that move you. Uh, I always say this is a question that the artist is always asking, you know, this moves me, does it move you? And so what you have to know, what moves you? You know, what colors move you? What um, music moves you? Uh, what your taste is? And, and um, that's so fundamental. And I think that one of the lessons I've learned that I like to, to teach my students is not to be afraid of using themselves, particularly, you know, in your first film. It's so important to really Put yourself out there, and uh, I always say great art should be embarrassing, you know, and um, and painful, you know, <laughs> and so, and I think that I think that that can be important, you know, to be willing to cry on your computer keys, and um, be still enough to hear the spirits talking to you, you know, and to use every part of yourself. It's so funny because. As actors, we know that we have to use every part of ourselves. But as directors, sometimes we forget, but actually you have to use every part of yourself to be a good director. And you were saying earlier, I heard you say, why the experience of being an actor yourself assisted you in mm -hmm. being a director mm -hmm. and directing this first project. Talk to me a little bit about that. And um, you're not going to hear my question, so mm -hmm. you have a question about the answer. Okay. What, what were you told? What did the actors tell you? Um, well, what I learned about directing from being an actor, um, 
is is varied, but I didn't really overthink it uh, or under or process it until I heard the actors um, doing interviews. Uh, you know, where they would talk about me and say, well, it's because I was an actor that I was a good director. Um, what I knew was the way that I liked to be directed and the kind of the lessons I, you know, I, the advantages I had where I'd been on movie sets and I'd worked with great directors. I'd worked with Spike Lee, I'd worked with Jonathan Demme, I'd worked with John Woo uh, on his first American film. You know, so I had um, I'd had that experience and, and I, I do think Though, when I was acting, I was mostly trying to um, hit my marks. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, quite nervous. I wasn't really thinking, oh, when I'm a director, I'm going to be like this. However, I remember Jonathan Demme. I remember one day asking Jonathan, like, how do you stay so upbeat and so focused? And um, he told me a story that had to do with how, he, how he'd evolved as a director. And so I did pay attention to that kind of thing, like being present, and being focused and um, and being prepared, because I have an anxiety disorder, so I get I get uh, I get anxious quite easily, and so being prepared is really um, the best cure for anxiety. You know, so uh, those are all lessons that I learned. In terms of directing actors, that was really just the way that I liked to be directed in a personal conversation, um, a quite intimate conversation, and in an intimate relation. It's a very intimate relationship in that you are leaning into, you know, by the time I finish the edit, I know all kinds of things about the actor, you know. I know their tics, I know, um, I know their tricks, you know, and, and I see deeply into their soul and that kind of relationship is, um, is, is again, it's, it's quite intimate relationship, you know, and I think that's important. That's the way I would like to be directed, you know, that's the way I, I've enjoyed being directed is when uh, somebody's leaning into my soul, right? Well, I mean, it's a long story. I thought I thought it, it was it was short stories that I wrote, and then the short stories took shape around the character of Louis Batiste, who was never the focus of, um, but but was like the the son that the other characters revolved around, and that the stories revolved around, and then that became my first draft, which I thought might be a novel. It was kind of like um, too long to be a screenplay and a little messy and. Um, but it wasn't quite a novel either because I didn't have the skills to write a novel. So it ended up kind of being a screenplay and um, I thought it was a, a very personal story and um, I knew I loved it but I wasn't really sure how it would communicate and that a passion for the story, a passion for the characters took me through the entire process, you know. I had a deep passion for it but I did not know um, nor did any of us know how the film would be received until um, until we opened at the Telluride Film Festival. And then we knew, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, we're on to something here, you know. Um, standing ovation, hmm, okay. You know, that's, that's, that's cool. And then Toronto happened, and so it was magical because I didn't anticipate it, you know. I didn't know, I didn't know anything, really, you know. I was uh, very much a novice at that part of it, at filmmaking. I, I knew some things about acting. I've been an actor, I've been in a lot of uh, movies, you know, by then, but I didn't really know anything about this process, and um, it, I was I'm blown away by, I continue to be blown away by Eve's Bayou, and, and, um, and just, it's the place it, it has secured for itself, you know, um, that I could never have anticipated. What was it that spoke to you about, we didn't call it content back then, but you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying, what was it about this, the words that spoke to you? Okay, so I knew that I wanted to experiment with um, dimensions and reality. So I knew that I wanted to ask the question, um, ask questions that were hard to answer or that might even be unanswerable. Like if two people remember something, an event differently, where's the truth lie? You know, um, I knew I wanted to, so the whole thing I would say is about smudged boundaries, you know, like the boundaries between adults and children, the boundaries between what's real and what's metaphysical. Um, you know, that's really what I was um, looking to explore. And a type of language 
uh, that I found tender. You know, the way that the, the black people in my family, the way that the way that a certain generation talked to children, you know, that I found very warm even when the words were harsh, you know. And I wanted to, like, you know, play games with me. I swear I'll slap you, but, you know. I wanted to um, experiment with that language and treat it like Shakespeare. Say that part again when they said what? Play games with me. I swear I'll slap you blind. Like, you know, that was um, the type of thing one might hear when I was a child, but it was warm. There was a warmth to it. Um, there was a love to it. It was not serious. It was, um, but it wasn't. It wasn't not serious, you know, <laughs> walk the line, you know, you might get slapped line, whatever that means, you know. But um, I don't know, I wanted to treat that language like Shakespeare. I wanted to treat that language very, very seriously. Uh, and so it was an experiment also in language and, and in the way that I heard black people talk. decisions did you make with the actors or actresses in this film to fill out uh, the characters? Well, I mean, um, you know what I, mean by that? I, I think, yeah. but do you want to elucidate? Um, in other words, I heard what you said earlier about each actor mm -hmm. and bringing each actor in. Can you talk to me about how you wanted those characters to come alive? Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about East Bayou is that some of the characters are based on family members of mine, right? It wasn't strictly autobiographical, but I knew the characters very well. Um, and so Roz was like my mother, you know? And um, so that was, it was kind of easy for me, you know, <laughs> having known my mother my whole life to, and, and Lynn inherently knew that, being from Louisiana and, and being from a, a large, colorful family, you know, Lynn just could inhabit that character, Rosalind, and, um, and bring her to life effortlessly. The children were interesting because they were contemporary to, to that time, right, to 1996 when we made the film. Um, and so we took the rehearsal process to unwind their mannerisms. And um, there was only, you know, there were certain gestures that I allowed and certain gestures I didn't. Um, and they had to get into this kind of period um, a, a formalness that I wanted the movie to have and, and the, their, their physical behavior to have, uh, which is quite, it's quite a sophisticated thing for a young person to, to do, you know. Um, and Journey just got Eve, and of course Eve had a lot of me in her, so I was able to recognize it when I saw it, and, and part of just finding this magnificent actor, all of these wonderful actors, um, was just, you know, knowing the character well enough to be able to see the potential, you know, um, when the actors auditioned. Let's talk about a few of them. Tell mm -hmm. me about finding Journey. So Journey was the last character, the last actor that I found. So the first character written, the last actor found. And um, that's because I was looking for such a specific quality, you know. Um, and I, I, I couldn't articulate it. I didn't necessarily have the skills to fully articulate it. Um, so I would say, you know, I want an earth. She's very authentic. She's an earthy girl. She, um, you know, she's got her mind. Part of her mind is always someplace else, you know. Um, but I wasn't quite articulating it uh, perfectly until I cast Journey. Um, and she... My casting director called me back to LA. I think I found Eve, you know, finally after all the searching. And as soon as she began to read, I realized that she had that quality. And I still couldn't articulate it, but I like to tell this story that Diane Carroll, you know, when I hired Diane, she said, well, who did you, who did you get to play Eve? And I said, Journey Smollett. And she said, oh, I know Journey. She's a spooky little girl. <laughs> and I said, that's the quality I was looking for. I was looking for a spooky little girl, because I was kind of a spooky little girl. And, um, and Journey, I think what she meant by that is Journey's has almost a foot, an otherworldliness, you know? 
there's an otherworldliness. That's the quality I was looking for. Um, somebody who has an otherworldliness, which is this wonderful quality that you see in movie stars often, you know, and, and, and Journey's a movie star, you know. She's got, she's got an otherworldliness that is sublime, and that's, that's what I was looking for, and that's what she brought. Samuel L. Jackson? Well, Samuel um, is, you know, I mean, he's magnificent, and he was um, already a big star, you know, um, but he had been doing character, you know, he's a character actor. And I think when he saw the short film that I made, Dr. Hugo, where Bondi, Bondi Curtis Hall, um, my husband, but my then boyfriend starred in it playing the sexy doctor. It was a little, almost like a, we call it now proof of concept for Eve's Bayou. And um, he wanted to be that doctor. Samuel wanted to be that doctor. And, and he's playing an aspect of my father, you know, um, which I shared with him. And, uh, you know, he, you're, he's, he, under, he got it. It's like a small town doctor that is very admired and that is a very, very, very flawed person. Um, and that succumbs to his own weaknesses in some ways, you know, um, but is magnificent and is, uh, is, is a magnificent character to me. So I had a lot of love for the character, um, you know, of Louis Batiste, and I wanted the audience to love this character, even though he's very flawed. And Sam bring, is so complex and, and um, and wonderful, such a wonderful actor, and he really brought all of that, uh, all of that. And and you know, there were there were times we'd fight over a line, you know, <laughs> how he said a line, and and I really tried to watch that too in his performance to make sure that uh, that Louis was accessible and um, understandable, and his his frailty. Um, it was just part of his complex, you know. Uh, persona and that th that the gray area of humanity is actually quite interesting and and um, you know so he really captured this character I mean I think he's magnificent Debbie well uh, Debbie Morgan was a friend of mine and I knew what a fantastic actor she was and and uh, she came in for an audition and threw down. She did like the eight minute monologue and she just, she threw down. She like, you know, slayed it. And then she left and she wouldn't come back. So I tried to get her to come back for a call back and she wouldn't come back. She was like, that's my performance. You have it. And she's like, it's, you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be that good again if I come back. Uh, that was really it. And, and so um, I fought for her. It was a big fight um, because it's an important character. And you know, we won, and Debbie is phenomenal in the role of Moselle. And Moselle also was based on my aunt Muriel, you know, so I knew that character very well as well, also. Diane Carroll? Diane. Uh, I was a huge fan, uh, as so many of us are, you know. Um, I grew up with Diane Carroll, of course, but I had seen Diane in Agnes of God on Broadway, playing the psychiatrist. And so uh, I had a window into her, her theatrical presence, and that was what blew me away. I mean, I, I snuck into the theater to, to watch it again and again. And when I told her that, I think that that had an influence on her accepting the movie. And Diane, you know, is so, is so gorgeous. And, um, you know, we shot her. and. And the producer started saying, well, she's not scary. She's too beautiful, you know. And I had to knock on her trail like, Diane, you know. <laughs> There's a concern that you are, um, you're too beautiful. And she said, oh, these bones. And I brought her this uh, book of, of, you know, African face painting. And I said, you know, do you think you might ever be interested in, <laughs> I was quite nervous. And, um, and boy, did she, she loved it, you know, she loved that. And it really, it kind of helped her character. But, you know, Diane's a magnificent actor, you know. I love her, I loved her, um, I loved her. You mentioned that as a director, and it's the first time director, mm -hmm. to have this range. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I you know, always say it's like the best um, 
film school, the best directing the actor class I could possibly have taken is having everybody from children to Sam Jackson, you know? Like, it, just this range of actors, everybody needing very specific things, you know? Um, I mean, that was wonderful. De you know, they, they're all, they were all different. Lynn, Lynn likes her director's presence um, very close, you know? Sam's like, you have director itis, get away from me, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was a whole range of experience. Um, and it really taught me, you know, that each actor is completely individual and that you have to give each actor the director that they need, you know. And so uh, that's who I try and be. I try and be the director that each actor needs me to be. That's beautiful. Lynn Whitfield, I would Lynn, um, Lynn has one of my favorite instruments of any actor. I mean, I think she's... Um, I think she's a giant of a talent. And I mean, just tremendous. And her process is tremendous. And what she brings to the character, I mean, she's just, you know, she's incredible. And uh, of course, I knew a lot about that character. Um, Who was she? she? She played Rosalind. So Roz is, is um, kind of based on my mother, you know. And the way that my mother looked to me when I was a child. Like, she was the most beautiful woman to me as a child, you know? Um, and Lynn, I mean, I can remember, we used to, you know, we processed film in those days, and I can remember the guys at the lab being like, <laughs> stop on freeze frames of her, and be like, how gorgeous is this woman? You know, I'm like, yeah, she's pretty gorgeous, you know? Um, that's Lynn Whitfield, you know? and just to be to be that graceful and beautiful and that good an actor i mean wow it's a movie star you know these are movie stars these are all movie stars you know even the kids right like now we look at them and it's like oh yeah that's that's dirty smollett and megan good you know um yeah i mean just uh, how fortunate was i to have that caliber of actor and Megan Good. Megan started off in our journey, our long journey of getting this film made. Megan started off as an Eve. She was kind of my favorite Eve. And so when we did the table reading with Sam Jackson, um, she played Eve. And she was great, you know. By the time we got the film made, <laughs> you know, I, I remember running into her and she had grown, as children do, <laughs> you know. And I said, uh, you want to... You want to read Cicely? And so it's, it's, it's really interesting because people have asked me about the content and how such a young actor could deal with such sophisticated content and what that was like. She had to kiss a grown man, you know, um, a movie star, <laughs> you know, uh, playing her father, you know, very complex stuff. And I always answer, well, she'd been with the project so long, she used to be Eve, all right? So she understood it. Her parents understood it. You know, her mother understood, they understood this script because she had been with the, pro you know, she, she, she had been with it since she was Eve. <laughs> yeah. Casey, why is it, why was it important to tell the story? I mean, it was important for me. Um, it, it had a, a, a therapeutic effect because I was talking about, um, I was reflecting on aspects of my childhood and the way the world looked to me and the way I experienced things. So, um, so it wasn't autobiographical. Um, I didn't grow up in Louisiana, for instance, you know, but it was deeply personal. So I, it was important for me to tell the story. I didn't know how important it was going to be for audiences, but I can tell you some of the things that happened, like, um, I would take meetings and, and they would comment that there were no white characters in it, you know. Um, and, and, you know, white people seemed quite offended by that. You know, like, <laughs> how do you have this intricate world and there are no white people in it? And, and, I, and I became increasingly more militant. Like, you know, we ain't always thinking about you. Like, we got our own problems, okay? Like, it doesn't have to be like, you know, the man, you know what I mean? Like, we have whole lives that are complex and that are rich without y'all in it. You know, and, and that became 
important to me. And I realized ultimately that being that specific, there's something universal that you can say. You know, in not talking about race in the film, it's saying it's making a huge statement about race, right? Um, and just how complex, beautiful, and fabulous, you know, we are, um, whether y'all know it or not, you know, and it became such, I became so militant about it that there are no white extras in East Bayou. There are no white people in East Bayou at all. And, uh, you know, that was, I think, quite bold, you know, <laughs> and... Um, Did you realize it at the time? Oh, yeah. I, I realized it, it, was intentional? it was intentional, but I, it became progressively more intentional because I was challenged on it. And so I pushed back, you know, I pushed back until there were no white people whatsoever <laughs> in East Bayou. Yeah. Um, I heard your good friend here talk about Love of Trust, the humanity mm -hmm. of what was on screen. Mm -hmm. Can you share a little bit about what audience were able to see that maybe many don't even realize today? Well, complex people um, in, the, you know, as African Americans, of course, we have our own hierarchies and, you know, we have our own uh, societal structures. And, and it was speaking about a specific group of people um, in a very specific way, you know. But I think that because I'm interested in the gray area of humanity, um, people that try and fail, you know, people that um, are complex, you know, that speaks to our humanity. That speaks to our shared humanity, right? Because we're all complex and we're all flawed and we all make mistakes and we all love our children and, um, you know, we, we all try and fail. And sometimes we're heroic and sometimes we're, we're horrible. And that, you know, that's important. It's important. Um, at the time, I saw a lot of movies where African Americans were, um, we were either very street and hard or we were very noble. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I wanted to talk about people. I wanted to talk about complicated, fabulous, messy people. And, um, and the fabulous is important as well because I wasn't seeing fabulousness that I could relate to. And I had, I had white people also challenge me on how fabulous people were and, and told me it was unrealistic. It's unrealistic. And I remember people saying specifically um, that the dress that Debbie Morgan had on at the party, would an African American have worn a dress like that? I have had, I had people ask me. And, um, and I, I said, well, that dress belonged to my line producer's mother, a gentleman in his 60s, and that dress was his mother's dress an African-American man, right? And so, um, yes, you know, we, we are fabulous, and we've been fabulous a very long time, <laughs> and you might not know it. Uh, and that, that's another way of speaking to humanity as well. It's like we, you know what, we're all fabulous and flawed and messy and heroic sometimes and, and terrible other times, and um, us too, you know, us too. And no, because I'm emotional, you know, um, and I don't even know why. Well, thank you. <laughs> you. And I just oh, thank you. Thank you. I want you to make sure we get that question to the audience, the answer to the audience about Debbie Morgan's dress. I'm going to. Okay. I, ju I, I just, I just wrote that down. Mm -hmm. because I so think it was a, okay. mm -hmm. I so think thank you. People thank need you. to hear that. Yeah.